Okay, so uh, that will just be like basics of uh, violin acoustics. So if we look at the general modeling of a musical instrument, we have uh, the player, uh, then the excitation of the, the instrument, the resonator, and then the radiation. And of course, it's always going both ways and the radiation is going towards uh, to the ear of the player who can adjust his excitation. So in the case of the violin, it's going to be the bowing uh, string. But so basically I will decompose my talk in the different aspect of, of this loop. And of course we shouldn't um, um, forget uh, the listeners because if you don't have listeners, you need some ears, uh, at least even painted ears too to listen to you. I couldn't resist putting this uh, knowing that he died uh, uh, last week. So, um, so as it's decomposed in two parts. Uh, first part, I will give a general overview of the functioning of a, of a violin, uh, talk about the static behavior, could talk about the boat string vibration, then we'll talk about the uh, body vibration and finish with the sound uh, radiation. So static behavior is the fact that because you have strings, can you see when I'm moving my mouse? Yes. 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 Uh, and so you have the strings pulling on one side, strings pulling on the other side, and that actually um, applies a lot of, uh, of weight on, of force on, uh, on the top plate. And this is actually about 100 Newton. So to give you an equivalent, it's about a pack of six uh, bottles. I had to put avion because I'm French, but uh, it can be any water. <laughs> Doesn't change anything. So that's a lot of um, of force if you think about the fact that the box is uh, not even or oh, just about 300 grams. So of course, from a static point of view, the instrument should be well built so it actually can hold this uh, static force. Now let's talk about string vibration. So uh, to give you an example, so this is not a string, string, but it's to actually introduce you to uh, modes and uh, resonances. Uh, I know that um, Colin has already talked about them and just want to go back to even more basics for, um, for some people it could be useful. So here, um, it's something which kind of behave like a string. We will put an excitation and we will see the deformation traveling. It will arrive at this end uh, where here, uh, I don't know how you call this in English, these uh, things. Um, it's fixed at this end. And so you will see the wave being reflected in some certain way and traveling back. So what is important to see is the fact that when it goes, it travels back, you see the sign is reversed. It's going below what it was up, okay? And this is because of the reflection at the fixed end. The fixed end imposes the fact that there is no movement. So the traveling wave towards the left has to, or oh, it's actually the reflecting wave has to compensate the traveling wave. So both of them cancel at the fixed end because it's fixed and it can't move, okay? And so if you excite a string fixed at both ends, which is the case of any string instruments, uh, the, the, they are fixed uh, at both ends, uh, either at the bridge or at the nerd, or at least to some extent fixed. Only specific frequencies will lead to a resonance, which is called a mode. For the other frequencies, all the reflected waves will eventually cancel each other. Because imagine that this is happening at this end, but then it has to happen at this end as well. And then if you don't have the proper number of what we call wavelengths, so up, down, up, down, going through zero, if you don't have exactly a certain number of wavelengths, then it will just cancel out. I will show you a video when you will see this a bit better. So 
So he's talking in French, so that's why I just don't put the noise. So he's talking about a string which is fixed at one end and at, at one end, and at this end is actually excited by a shaker at different frequency. And you can see that for some frequencies, nothing happens, and then suddenly you have like a, a much bigger um, uh, vibration of, of the string, and that's called the mode. Mode three, you have uh, two nodal points here. Mode four, you have one, two, three. Mode five, even more. And now it's going down again in terms of frequency. So we'll go back to mode four, then mode three. You see in between, nothing really happens. And then now mode two, and then mode one. Another way to look at this is to use a stroboscope. And as a stroboscope, you can set it up at a certain frequency. And so uh, if you set it up properly, you can actually see different position of the string during one cycle of uh, vibration. So you can actually see what, how the string is moving with a, within the envelope that you saw in at the beginning of the movie. Uh, so this was for mode one, now this is for mode two. And then we will have mode three. And then mode four. Uh, so what happens when the, 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 bow, the string is bowed? So what happens here, instead of having a shaker exciting the string, here it's the bow moving. And what happens is that the bow will actually drag the, the string at some point, and that will provoke, um, causes a, a kink, which will travel between the two fixed ends. What you can see is at some point of the cycle, the string is actually sticking to the bow and moved along with the bow. And at some other point of the period, the string is actually slipping. So what happened is the string is grabbed by the bow. And at some point, because there is some, uh, it's like a, a rubber band. If you, if you pull it too much, at some point it wants to come back or, or spring, it will come back and slide under the bow. And this is called the stick slip motion. That's another way of looking at it. You see the corner is traveling um, in the, big dimension when it's sticking and the corner here the kink is is uh, traveling in the small area here when it's uh, uh, slipping so you can see it in a different way by actually looking at uh, the velocity so here we have the bow velocity and during the sticking regime what happens is that the string velocity is actually the same as the bow velocity because the string is sticking to the bow and so they travel with the same speed and you can see that the reflected kink is traveling here so but, i'm sorry but basically this is reversed compared to this um, in the slipping regime now the kink is, is is traveling in the small part of the length uh, between the bow and the bridge. And here, the bow velocity is still up, but now the string velocity is the other side because the string is slipping under, under the bow. And if we look at the string displacement at the bowing point, you have a slipping regime, um, a slipping regime followed by a sticking regime uh, because it's going one way when it sticks and then suddenly, more abruptly, it will slip under the bow. Um, so the speed with which this wave travels, so this king travels here, uh, and therefore its frequency is actually the same as that of the freely vibrating string. And that's why I started with a freely vibrating string excited with, with a shaker. And that's why as well, you all know this because if you play Pizzicato or Arco, you have the same uh, frequency. Okay. We can see it uh, here. Uh, so here I was, I show you the string displacement at bowing point. Here now I'm actually showing you the velocity at bow. So velocity of the bow, and then suddenly it slips. So it's going, um, it's crazy, it becomes negative because it's going the other way. 
and then goes back to the velocity of the bow, slips, goes the other way, and goes back with the uh, velocity of the bow when it's sticking. So we have the sticking period here, sticking phase, and the slipping phase here. We can look as well at the force at the bow edge. This is a sawtooth. Uh, the force building, building, building up, and then uh, release and building up again and release. This is called the Helmholtz motion, and this is even called the idealized version of the Helmholtz motion. Uh, of course, in real life, you never have sharp corners like this. That doesn't exist in the physical world. And we will see what happens in real life in a minute. Uh, the frequency I told you is fixed by the speed of the wave traveling uh, in the string. And this doesn't change with both speed, bow force, nor bow position. Okay, it's something uh, fixed uh, depending on the string material and the string tension. Uh, so how do you change the amplitude? Um, uh, it's by using the, the bow speed that allows to change the amplitude. A larger speed will um, end up in a higher amplitude. And here you have a little uh, animation where you see different uh, speed. The blue is a slow bowing speed and the medium bowing speed in pink and then fast bowing speed in red. And you can see that the amplitude is uh, growing. So the kink is, is bigger and that makes a, a larger amplitude. And what about the tone color that you can change with the bow string? Uh, so as I explained, with the idealized Helmholtz motion, there is no change because it's abrupt, but in, we are in a real world. And so the wave of form is actually quite a bit different. There is no abrupt jumps of velocity, but instead there are smoother variations and the detailed shape varies with the force. So if, here you have uh, the Helmholtz motion for a large bow force, which you see it's getting close to the idealized uh, forms that we saw earlier with not as sharp, of course, but still quite sharp um, uh, shape here. But with a smaller ball force, you see it's much more rounded. Okay? And obviously, the more sharper it is, the more higher frequency you have in, in the spectrum. So, and that's how violinists and makers know if you apply more force, you get a richer sound with the higher harmonics. Okay, so nothing new here, it's just explaining how it works uh, physically. So the bow force will affect the harmonic content uh, of the signal. Uh, what must the player do to get Helmholtz motion? So for a given bow speed, uh, he needs the right combination of force and position. So this is called the Schelling diagram. And I just reproduce here uh, a diagram made by uh, Woodhouse after Schelling. Uh, you have the bow force in a logarithmic scale. Here you have the bow position in a logarithmic scale as well, near the bridge on the left, near the fingerboard. And you have a range in, within a, like a triangle shape of Helmholtz motion. If you're outside this range, either you get uh, a sticking which is too long and that would be raucous. And that's when you like press it so hard, like you get, okay. Or if you don't press enough, then you have the surface sound, it's slipping too soon. And that's what you could have when you really almost um, don't put any, any force on, on, on your bow. Uh, so the Helmholtz motion is between a maximum bow force and a minimum bow force. And here I give you examples. So this is a, a sawtooth I was uh, telling you uh, earlier which of course looks a bit more irregular because this is a real measured uh, sawtooth and not just an ideal, idea, idealized uh, sawtooth. Here, uh, it's slipping too soon. So you see it starts slipping before it actually reaches uh, the point down there. And that's why you, start, you have a slip. So in, within a period you have two slips instead of one. And this is a sticking too long, and then you get something a bit uh, chaotic. Uh, one of the beginner's errors would be to slip above maximum bow force or below minimum force by moving bowing points. So you, they play with a constant uh, speed, uh, constant force, but they're kind of moving this way because they can't control the position. And so by doing this moving between the bridge, closer to the bridge and closer to the fingerboard, and applying the same force, 
they move here and they will move from the surface sound to uh, a rocker sound and only achieving Helmholtz uh, in the middle here. Um, do the Schelling force limits vary between instruments or between notes? Um, uh, according to theory, the maximum bow force doesn't, but the minimum bow force does. It varies between instruments and it changes with frequency too, so it varies between uh, notes. And of course, if it varies, that changes the range which is available to the player. And we can wonder what is the link with uh, playability. And I will talk about this in the second part of uh, my talk. Any question at this time? No, fine. OK, body vibration. Um, so the dimension of the string is too small to move the air around and to radiate. So you don't hear the sound because of the string moving, but because the string excites the bridge, which in turn excites the top plate and the whole body. And this top plate and the whole body will actually is big enough to actually be able to put uh, the air around into motion and, and to radiate. Um, so you have the force. Uh, which is makes the, the bridge uh, rocks uh, bowing direction. And then uh, here you can have the air uh, flowing in and out while the full body uh, moves and the, the, the plates can bend and vibrate. And uh, we go back to that later as well. Um, now, the same as um, as the, the string, the string has modes, but the bridge has modes too. And so the frequency response of the bridge is not flat. And uh, it has actually two main resonances, one which is uh, around 3,000, the other one closer to about 4,500, something like this. Uh, and then in turn, the bridge, so the bridge has its own frequency response, and then the body has its own frequency response as well, which uh, with minimal modes. And so the frequency response is far from being flat. Um, I'll go back to modes uh, here because I told you that you know string has modes and bridge has modes and body has modes. Actually, any physical structures has what we call modes. That means that frequency of resonances. Um, and I will um, give you an example of square plate modes. To you have already seen the most of you clanny. Um, pictures of like uh, violin plates and but here it's about a square mode and pretty picture so I think as an entertainment I will show you this video. Pour faire vibrer la plaque on utilise un archet. On obtient des ondes stationnaires avec des nœuds et des ventres de vibration. Cependant on ne les voit pas car le mouvement est trop faible. Pour visualiser la vibration on verse une fine poudre sur la plaque. On voit donc que le sable se concentre sur les endroits qui ne vibrent pas. On les appelle des lignes de nœuds ou encore lignes nodales. So just explaining that where the sand is actually accumulating is where the plate doesn't move and that we, have, we call nodal lines. Same with the string, you could see points along the strings which are not moving. And here it's the same, except it's not a point because now we are in two dimensions. So there are lines. Uh, can you hear the sound or not of the video? Yes, we hear the sound. Okay. If you noticed, he knows exactly, I mean, he has prepared his, his, uh, this, and you, you can see where he's bowing and he, that he's actually putting his finger as well. So here he was bowing here, which is uh, an anti-node, okay, where you will have maximum vibration. And if you paid attention, he actually put a finger here. Uh, and so that kind of imposes a node here because he's holding the plate. So the plate will not move at that point. And that's why he excites where it's moving a lot and is actually imposing a condition to, to favorize this uh, special mode.
Good idea. Uh, Anders uh, asks if it is a violin bow or something heavier. It's too, it looks like a violin bow. I don't think it matters. Anything will will work. Um, and so uh, I will talk a bit more about modes uh, in my uh, talk tomorrow because I will talk about model analysis. Uh, so more on this uh, tomorrow. Um, so back to what I was uh, saying. So here we have the input waveform. So this is um, now you know it's the so tooth. Okay, that's the force, the vibrating string force. Oh. And this is actually going through the bridge response and then the body response. So the sawtooth has a spectrum which looks like this. So if this one, the fundamental is an amplitude of one, the second harmonic has an amplitude of two, the, uh, one over two, the third harmonic has an amplitude of one over three and so on, okay? The nth harmonic has an amplitude of one over n. And so this spectrum, we can see it in a spectral domain that actually this is going to be multiplied by this and then by this to give you the final uh, output spectrum. And this can be put back from, um, through I EFFT, inverse FFT into the time domain. So from a, a sawtooth uh, originated from the bow, um, uh, you get this uh, complex output waveform due to the, what we call filtering in physics of the bridge response and the body response. And this can actually be simulated uh, or, uh, in a, a computer. Um, so we can reproduce this behavior uh, digitally. So we record the force applied to the bridge by the vibrating strings with, by using piezos on, on, on the bridge. Uh, uh, so little piezos here, which can record the force of the vibrating string. So we, rec we can record a piece of music. Here, we actually, for this part here, we do measure it. We can measure it with a hammer and uh, laser vibrometer. So this is called the bridge um, mobility or bridge admittance, as some of the people have already talked about it today. And then by doing this filtering with a computer, you can synthesize a violent sound without radiation because here we are just using the vibratory response of the violin and without radiation. So I'll give you, this is a signal heard with a piezo, uh, recorded with a piezo. Are you hearing it properly? Because I wonder whether I shared the audio or you are just listening it through my loudspeakers. We hear the audio as well. Yeah, okay. Just, uh, okay. It stayed, just make sure. Um, Okay, so this is, I represent here, uh, an admittance response. So the type of curve that you have already seen in previous talks. So we represent the amplitude as a function of frequency. And because it's as a function of frequency, basically that's why we call it a frequency response. Okay, this frequency response can be as, uh, as a velocity, as a function of the frequency, can be as a sound um, level, if you look at radiation, it could be other things, it's basically, the response of a physical structure which is put into vibration and you can look at the velocity the sound level or different things but it's basically how the structure vibrates as a function of frequency uh, in most cases in like most like for example aviation or automotics autom uh, and everything they actually look at this to cancel these vibrations because usually they are disruptive and they can lead to uh, faults and, and breakdowns. In the case of musical instruments, we look at them because we actually want sound coming out of this structure. So it's quite different, but it's the same types of uh, methodology of measurements. And now, so, so the piezo you could hear 
Um, so I'll, I'll play it again because we can, so we can compare better. And if you if here's the difference between the two sounds, one what what is really striking is the fact that uh, this sounds more like almost like a cello compared to a violin, and that's because if you look. So the admittance of the violin is quite low at low frequency. So of course, the low frequency is, is not there, it's gone. And, uh, and, and you all know that, that the, the, fund, like the G string, the first few notes on the G string, they barely have any fundamental. It's what you really hear is a second, third, and fourth harmonic. And then your brain actually recreates the fundamental, but the fundamental, you see, can be 20 dBs lower than any harmonics which will be around here. And that's, you can clearly hear the difference in the low notes between this one, which sounds more like a kind of cello. And here's this one where you basically cut the low frequencies because of multiplying by something which is very low around this uh, frequency range. Now, uh, so this is the bridge mobility, another way of, of measuring things. And uh, Tim will recognize this violin. And so that sound radiation that we like to do in an anechoic chamber, so we don't have any reflections from uh, the walls. So it's the same principle. You uh, activate, you excite the bridge with a little hammer here, so a bit small. And you measure with a microphone the response, the frequency response of the violin. You can measure it by uh, going around the violin. So in this case, it's easier just to move the violin around. So the, the violin will move around and the, the microphone will stay um, uh, fixed, but doesn't really matter. One is moving compared to the others. And so you can measure at different angles. Okay. Um, and so then uh, we end up this kind of, of curve that um, Colin has actually uh, explained this morning. Uh, so we can see different things. We can see the main, uh, signature modes, which are called signature modes because they are the ones that you can, um, they are well separated. Uh, well, at higher frequency, it's more like mini modes overlapping. Uh, A0, often called the Helmholtz mode. Here are the CBR and B1 minus and B1 plus. I will get back to this uh, slightly later. Here, an area called the transition hill. Then the bridge hill area, which is usually, which is due, due to the, as, at the same time to the bridge rocking frequency and the island uh, underneath the, the bridge feet, a combination of, of both. And and, uh, George says that apparently it's not the five strats, but five microphone positions. Ah, it's, I didn't put five, I put five strats because that's what Colin put in his talk this morning. <laughs> well. so, so, okay. So that's five microphone position of one strad. It doesn't matter, we don't care anyway. It's just like, it looks cool too. <laughs> uh, so, okay, five microphone positions. Um, yeah, because it's true that it would be a bit weird to have five strides aligning so much. That's really, yes, indeed, it would be. I just, I saw this on, um, on Colin so I said, oh, I should, should add a, a legend. And then I didn't even think about the fact that it's, it didn't make any sense. Thanks, George, for correcting me. Um, and, and then here you can see that at higher frequency, the, the slope is, is going down and the response of the violin is getting uh, lower and, and lower. Now we can actually use the same methodology for sound synthesis uh, that I described just before with the bridge admittance by actually using a radiation measurement. Uh, and so here is uh, one of the Bilbao violins um, with uh, sound radiation uh, measurement. So it's not that great. I, I have to, I, I, I totally agree with, with you, but actually it, it's, it can be useful to compare violins. And I will talk about this on, uh, on Friday with some new results about the Bilbao project, where actually a bunch of, of um, the Vilfava group have compared these different uh, Bilbao violins through this sound synthesis. 
And it's pretty amazing how uh, they were able to recognize the different violins, which means that there is something being captured here through this measurement, even though it doesn't really sound like a real violin. Okay, but so more on this on, uh, on Friday. Uh, now, um, I want to go into more details of a few aspects. Uh, so first, uh, the origin of the signature mode. I will basically stop where Colin started this morning. Um, so we have, here we have coupled oscillators. We have the air vibrating inside the cavity and we have uh, plates um, bending. Uh, and so these two are, um, these are, are coupled. So what actually happens is when you have uh, one oscillator, you have one mode and one eigenfrequency or resonance frequency, depending, doesn't matter, it's different names of the same thing or modal frequency. And when you have two coupled oscillators, because you have two oscillators with one mode each, you end up with two modes. But the eigenfrequencies of these coupled oscillators are lower and above the original eigenfrequencies of the two independent oscillators. So you don't create modes. If you have, you have two oscillators, you have two, one mode each, you couple them, you end up with two modes, but the eigenfrequencies are lower and higher than uh, the two independent oscillators. So here I give you an example. We have two springs, okay, uh, linked by a spring. So the mass and the spring here, the blue mass and this spring is one oscillator. The green mass and this spring here is a second oscillator. Uh, their displacement is, is in blue and, and green and they are coupled by a spring in the middle. And you will see you have two modes, uh, this one, where they are actually moving in phase and it's the rather low frequency. And you have a more higher frequency mode where this time the two masses are actually moving uh, uh, in opposite phase. And this is what happened with the uh, A0 and B1 mode. Uh, we have here for the air, the air ASO, the air flows out of the sound hole in phase with the inward moving top plate. And for the B1 mode, it's the opposite. They are actually moving in, in phase. So this is actually more what happens for a guitar. Uh, this is the model for the guitar. For the violin, of course, it's a bit more complex because there is not just a top plate, there is a back plate and both of them are coupled with a sound post. So it's a bit more complicated. But this is to go, I remember this morning, um, Colin showed animations where you could see the plates vibrating and there was this dot, you could see the dot moving. Uh, and he said, you know, at the ASIO, the dot was moving uh, in, in opposite phase and then with B1, mode, the, the, the dot, which represents the air moving inside um, throughout the effort was moving uh, with the, the, the plates. I told you I will talk uh, about playability again. So uh, I would like to report a little project which was conducted by Jim, uh, George and uh, Robin Aitchison. And I'd like to talk about some results from my uh, PhD student, Timothy Wofford. So uh, Jim has derived a formula which provides a minimum bow force based on the bridge mobility as a function of frequency, as I told you, it's a frequency response. And of course it depends on the string properties and that's why you have a minimum bow force for each string. 
the one curve per each string. Uh, so here you can see uh, this is for the G string. And then here, uh, unfortunately, they are the same colors, but um, this is a D string. And then you have the A string. And then here, starting here, the E string. And uh, so these were for a cello. Uh, starting at 65 hertz. And they are, the minimum ball force is calculated for each uh, played note. So the different strings, as I explained, uh, here you have the bottom C and then the octaves put in, in orange, so you know where you are. And all these gray lines are the different uh, semitones. Uh, then they they played the cello and realized there were a few notes which was a bit uh, harder to play uh, and they called them the problem notes. So, uh, and uh, they so they first found them by by playing. And then they decided to do something about it. So uh, they did a full model analysis and could see where uh, basically there was a lot of activity on the plates at these frequencies and then decided to intervene at this specific position where there was lots of activity with two different um, solutions. Uh, one with uh, some mass, they added some mass where it was moving a lot or they added uh, some straps. And what happens is that actually, if you compare the original with the straps, you can see that the first uh, peak uh, was actually quite reduced uh, and turned into a few peaks, but with much lower amplitude. But then the main wolf note was, uh, was still there. With the mass, now it's actually the other two modes. So the first problem note, problematic note is still there, but the other two notes were um, well uh, reduced. And this is one of the case where acoustics really agrees with players because basically uh, they, the, the minimum buffer showed the problematic note. They corresponded perfectly to what the players uh, felt in terms of, of problematic and wolf notes. And then with the model analysis, they were able to see where they should put the straps or the mass. And then they redid the calculation, they remeasured the bridge at mobility and uh, we computed the minimum buffer. And so that it was indeed reduced and the player could feel that the, the notes were easier to play. Okay, so this is what the straps were that were used. What does it mean? Yeah. So apparently, and then maybe George or, or if he's still there could uh, jump in. Uh, so they were, I think they put like some um, little, uh, pieces of wood across, or maybe Robin was supposed to come at some point. So I don't know if he's here, they could comment. Um, it, it, it's a, it's, um, they did a quite a lot of experiment with um, putting like a little, either blue tag or little uh, pieces of wood, different things to actually try to have local modifications on, on, on the top plate. George, are you here? Do you want to comment? Yeah, uh, and I was trying to type in some messages into the chat. So uh, basically, when, when after the word analysis, rather than looking at just the uh, the displacement or velocity of, of, of um, the top in various areas, we looked at the bending, and in particular the crosswise bending, and that is how how we determine where to put the strap. And the, and the straps are are just made of spruce. Um, fitted to the surface and then they were glued on with uh, high glue and, and paper. So uh, does that answer the question? I think it does. Is there more question? I can see the chat lighting up, but uh, I can't. Uh, someone asks, why do you have to reduce the amplitude of the modes? It was, uh, I think, on my... Um, Okay, so because if the minimum ball force goes too high, that means that you can't play piano anymore, you know? Or like, because with the usual, with the usual force that you would use to play 
uh, not piano, but to play with a certain uh, timbre, certain quality, uh, you would use a rather light force. And then if you use this usual force, you would maybe be here. That means that you will actually be below the minimum force. And so you can't have the Helmholtz motion. And so this is a problem. That means that for this note, you would have to apply a lot of force to get them going. And this can be problematic for the player. I think you will get a, a Wolf uh, for the highest uh, admittance there. Sorry, I didn't hear. <clears throat> you will probably get a Wolf note for the highest uh, uh, admittance curve there. Yes, that's what I said, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's getting, a, it's a Wolf note, yeah. And so, and so it, it's problematic. So by reducing it, that means that you actually, uh, the minimum ball force gets lower and then you are, you are fine in terms of what the usual force that you apply to play. Does that answer the question? I suppose yes. Or give me a shout if it doesn't. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so this is for the wolf note, and it's actually the most uh, well understood uh, problem uh, now uh, because, uh, but it's very specific. So usually, I mean, especially for, uh, true for, for cellos, uh, there are plenty of cellos which have a wolf note, and it's not necessarily a big problem for, for cellists, and usually they can find a way to go around. And sometimes, even if this peak is slightly high, they can go around. A beginner will struggle, but a professional may not even uh, struggle and find a way to, to actually uh, play that note properly. So that on this is the most important thing for them. And often players say that, well, a good shadow often has a, has a big wolf and they just have to, to cope with it. Um, so, uh, so it's a limited problem, but not necessarily something which is so relevant to players to some extent, especially not as a global um, evaluation. When they talk about frequencies, they may mention at some point the, the wolf node, but sometimes not even, even if it has a wolf node, just because they will mention plenty of other things. So, um, um, so I've done uh, some work with uh, Timothy Wofford uh, during his PhD. Uh, to understand a bit more what is uh, playability and do musicians actually approach or exceed the upper and lower limits. So for this, we used what we call motion capture. So how does it work? You have a set of like infrared cameras here, here and all around on the players. These cameras will actually send infrared light and this light will actually be reflected by you can see tiny um, reflectors here, passive reflectors uh, on the bow here at the frog and uh, at the frog and the tip and on the cello uh, here and on the side. And so uh, the light reflected by these passive markers will actually be sent back to the camera. And so with this system, you can keep track uh, in real time of the movement of the bow and the movement of the cello. Um, so, um, and in our case, this can uh, give us access to the position of the bow compared to the cello. So to know where the, the bow is positioned uh, closer to the bridge or closer to the fingerboard, we can have access to uh, the speed of, uh, of the cello. And indirectly, we can have access to the force. However, this is very challenging because you have to imagine that basically, um, so we need to find a way to measure the, for, the, the, the force as something, uh, as a displacement because that's what uh, cameras will record. So basically we actually record the displacement of the string. So the depth, the, the string, by, by, when you press on the string with the bow, the string will go downwards a bit. Um, and the bow hair will actually go up a bit. And by measuring the depth, I would say, of um, between the string and, and the bow hair, 
uh, and knowing at which part of the bow it is and which part on the string it is, we kind of uh, correlate this with some force, with some calibration procedure. The problem is the fact that you have, as a rule of thumb, one Newton correspond to 0.1 millimeter uh, uh, displacement of uh, the string and, and, and the bow hair. Um, and so that means that um, uh, it's one millimeter. So one Newton is one millimeter. So if you want a precision of 0.1 Newton, which is not that great as a precision, that's 0.1 millimeter. And, and so it's very tough with this system, which is more designed to actually look at, uh, at people, you know, how people move like uh, sport players or even musicians or, but how people move and how they interact with the environment. And of course, the precision of a, of a musician is not, you know, 0.1 millimeter. And so we are basically at the limit of, of that system. So we struggled a lot to get uh, some accuracy about the force. But I think we get something accurate enough to derive some uh, conclusion, uh, though. Uh, so, so with this system, we could actually monitor um, what happens with one given player playing two different instruments. So here is uh, one of the musical excerpts that was played. And below, we have the bow force. In red, it's the applied force by the player. So the one that we actually measure or like estimated with this uh, motion capture system. And then in black and kind of uh, greenish, that's the upper limit from the Schelling diagram and the lower limit um, computed with uh, G. Mudau's model. Um, it's actually easier to see it in a slightly different way where this one, this time we actually normalize the bow force by the upper limit. So of course the upper limit divided by the upper limit gives you a straight line. Then we have the red, uh, which is the applied force divided by the upper limit. And here we have the minimum force divided by the lower limit. And what you can see is that actually the red curve very rarely crosses the black. And that's only when you can see it's the change of the note, okay? So, uh, and that's because the Schelling's upper limit goes to zero when bow speed goes to zero. And that's what we can see here. It goes to zero each time the bow speed goes to zero and the bow speed goes to zero when you uh, change uh, direction with your bow. And that's why at these places, uh, the red curve actually crosses the black curve, but that's basically you change direction, so you are not exactly playing. So the Schelling's limit is usually greater than, uh, much greater than the red curve, and it's actually greater than what bow deformation allows. So the true upper limit is not determined by bow deformation. Uh, it's determined, no, it's actually determined by bow deformation, not friction interaction. So basically, the limit for a player is the fact that if you press too hard, the hair will collapse to the bow stick. And that's actually the upper limit. Now, if we look at the minimum bow force, uh, we can see as well that the red curve is really most of the time above the minimum bow force. Uh, and the only cases where it's not, it's basically because the player was actually lifting the bow of the string. And of course, then there is no force applied, but the player is not playing either eye um, anyway, so it doesn't matter. So based on this, we can see that because the ball force is far above the uh, limit, we believe that uh, the small changes in the lower limit are not likely to be perceived, except when it can get problematic, which is around wolf nodes. And here we are again with the wolf nodes. But uh, far from wolf notes, uh, we believe that it doesn't really have any effect on the playability, at least as perceived by, evaluated and perceived by players. As a sum of rule, the upper limit is actually superior to 20 Newton. And your usual range for a player is between one Newton or like 0.5 Newton and 10 Newton. So, you know, going to 
So upper limit of 20 Newton is really a lot. And the lower limit is uh, below 0.2 Newton. While as I told you, the player usually uses at least 0.5 Newton. So uh, the player is really well between the two limits. Yes, Anders? Uh, I wonder, uh, you probably said, but the bow force, is it uh, extracted from uh, optical readings? Uh, it, it, it is it is extracted from optical readings at the same time using some calibration procedure. Okay. So basically, um, what we actually do is at some point we remove the cello and we play a force sensor. Yeah. And and so we can actually uh, make a correspondence between the deformation of the bow for a given force at a given position on the bow and mm. force that we can read directly for the force sensor. Mm. And then it's in three dimensions then. Yeah. And so yeah. the deformation of the bow is obtained with the optical device. Mm. The bow sensor is mounted with uh, reflectors as well. So we can have the, you know, the deformation of the, the bow compared to the force sensor. And, and so this is our calibration procedure. So then we know that for a certain deformation of the bow at a certain point of contact on the bow, point of contact, I mean, between the bow and the string, we, will, we know that this corresponds to that force. And so we can go back while uh, playing. Okay, thanks, very impressive. This all only works, I have to say, this only works uh, not exactly close to the frog for obvious reasons, because close to the frog, the deformation of the bow is almost none. Okay, so we are not sensitive enough to actually be able to measure a deformation of the hair. So basically, it actually works from, we have to be aware about a force of, of the total hair length. So everything measured um, close to the frog is not relevant or not valid. Okay, but at least we have access to the force from basically this to, to the end of the bow. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, so here, uh, so this is a, a, a slightly different uh, Schelling diagram, uh, which has been uh, invented by uh, Timothy Warford. Uh, because I told you the, the, the problem with the Schelling diagram is the minimum bow force depends on the frequency. So actually you should, and, and, and it depends on the speed. So you basically need a Schelling diagram for every speed and every note. Here, this is a, what we call a normalized uh, Schelling diagram, which allows you to put all the notes on the same diagram. So you normalize the bow force as we did normalize it here by the upper limit. And so that's why now the upper limit is horizontal. And, and we normalize as well uh, with some, uh, some tricks, the bridge to bow distance. I don't want to go into the detail. But the good thing is now we can actually put all the notes that we actually recorded during the three hour session. We recorded different excerpts, so different notes were played with different bowing parameters. And we can put all the notes uh, F3, which were played for different, you know, bow speed and bow position, and we can all put them on the same um, diagram. I told you there were two different cellos, so this was uh, done thanks to, uh, with uh, Paul Nule. So Paul Nule found two uh, Romanian uh, cellos, which were very similar, and then worked on them uh, first to, to improve them. Then he worked on them as well to actually make bridges that will, um, because I didn't tell you about this because I don't really need in this talk, but you can see cables. So the bridges were mounted with piezo sensors. You know, I showed you a graph with piezo sensors uh, on, the, on the bridge of a violin. So here we did the same on the bridge of the cellos. And because the piezo sensors are very uh, rigid, that changes quite a lot. The, how the, the bridge behaves. So Paul made bridges which kind of are like, I would say almost like extra soft to compensate for the rigidity of the piezos. Okay. And then uh, to actually make these two cellos different, he decided to set one, uh, to adjust one as a, what he called soup, like uh, soft, which would be more for what he says for amateurs players. 
who don't like to have too much resistance. And the other one, he adjusted it with the sound post more like as a, as a tight or rigid cello, which he would do as the adjustment he would do more for like uh, professional players who want more uh, resistance. If Paul is here and he wants to comment on this, uh, if I said something wrong, just jump in. Um, and so uh, you have the cello soup, like the amateur cello is in yellow and the other one is in blue. And you can see that for this note, the F3, they basically lie on top of each other. Okay. So this very light dot here is, you know, exactly the point I was telling you before is when you have this crossing, which happens because there's basically artifacts, okay or this crossing here, which are artifacts because the, the player is lifting the bow. Uh, and that's why there are not so many of them, but the main concentration of, of points is here. And you can see that it's really well within the limit of uh, the maximum bow force and the minimum bow force. Now, what happens for F sharp three? Actually, F sharp three is at the wolf node and it was much more pronounced on the tight shadow than it was on the soft shadow. And you can see now that there's actually quite a clear separation. And you see that the blue dots are much closer now to the limit uh, than the, the yellow dots. And actually what happens is because of this normalization, what you should imagine is basically this line, the minimum both force has moved closer to the point than for this cello than it is for this cello because the minimum both force is higher. And so the, the, the points are closer to the minimum both force than they are. But still, even for the wolf note, and uh, you can still see some distances for most cases. So the, the, even for the wolf note, the player was not really struggling uh, with, with the limit because it's still between uh, the limit. So uh, we do believe that the Helmholtz range in the Schellen diagram has very little influence on the playability as uh, usually evaluated in a global way by uh, players um, beyond any wolf node problems. Uh, so it, it has an influence on the wolf node, but we believe not so much. So this idea that maybe the range, you know, available for the player for different instruments could be increased and that the player would feel it and would find it more playable for us, um, uh, it doesn't seem like a good um, direction to, to look into it. Now, that doesn't solve the problem of what playability is because uh, they're still, we still don't understand what it is, but we feel like this limit is not uh, what is uh, beyond, uh, behind uh, this umbrella playability. Any question about this? No questions in chat. Sorry? Nothing in the chat, okay. Okay, and uh, I'd like to finish with more like uh, a perceptual uh, study about the influence of the, of the model between Strad and Guarnerius models by means of a free sorting task. So to introduce a bit um, some methodology that we can use, uh, especially that I will uh, talk about this methodology on, 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 Friday, on Friday. So, uh, as you know, you know, Stradivarius and Guarneri are the two most famous Cremonese makers and their models are extensively copied. And we all know that differences in models will affect sound and response, but as well as differences in mood and glue and varnish. And so uh, can different models for each maker, so there are specific uh, uh, feature which are recognized um, they are recognizable by experts. Uh, do they have like a, a specific features in terms of sound? So, uh, sorry, I got confused with my own sentence. I hope uh, it's clear. So basically they are uh, makers. You are very good at telling apart uh, the Jesu model from um, a Strad model, just visually. Can you tell them apart from uh, a sound point of view? So here, that the two models, I don't think you have uh, any um, hesitations uh, for telling me which is a Strad and which is uh, Guarnerius. 
and also what about the sound? Um, so, um, but it is actually believed that there are characteristics which are specific to Del Gesù instruments compared to the various instruments. And uh, actually uh, Augusto and, 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 and Fabio talked about this with the um, measurements with the, the brightness thing. Uh, but is that um, uh, something like, uh, is it believed? Can we measure it? And so in particular, this I think summary very well what I've heard for many years is that the Guarnel del Jesu vines tend to exhibit a deeper, darker tone than the silky rich tone of a Strad. Players who prefer a shorter scale length, a darker sound and a limitless cache of tonal variants tend to prefer Guarneri. Players who prefer precision and refinement tend to prefer a Stradivari. Uh, and so uh, this is something that we wanted to test in a blind uh, folded experiment. And we decided to go for um, a free sorting task. So what is a free sorting task? Is basically you are free to sort the stimuli you have in different groups. And you are free to choose how many groups you want to make and based on which criteria and yeah. So it was elaborated in the field of cognitive psychology it's a common method used in sensory analysis and perception. And uh, it's a good way to explore criteria of categorization without any a priori physicalist conceptions because you let participants absolutely free about their criteria of grouping. Categorization is really how uh, our perception works because that's something we have been used to do from basically our early childhood, you know. You see that most animals have two legs or four legs or six legs or eight legs. It's very rare to have seven legs or three unless there is a problem. So we, are, we know how to group animals by the number of legs. You know, a table is something which has three or four legs. Uh, you know, there are different things that we know we recognize by some um, uh, attributes and we make groups and categories. And so, and that's how perception works. It's not usually dimensional. It doesn't really move dimensionally continuously along a dimension. It's more like groupings. And here, because we wanted to test Strad versus Guarnerio, that was really appropriate for a categorization because basically we wanted to see whether we will end up with two groups, one with the Strads and one with the uh, Guarnerio models. Um, so at that time, I, when I did that test, uh, this categorization task had been used for instrument evaluation by listeners, but never in a, in a playing test. Um, so I did this uh, uh, while being in Indianapolis uh, during a VSA convention. Uh, invited 21 violinists, 15 professionals, six amateurs, and we were blindfolded and using their own bow in dim lighting. So the usual um, setup. And I used nine violins. So I had uh, two authentic uh, strads, one authentic Del Gesù, and then I had two new violins based on a Del Gesù, and then three va new violins based on a strad model and then one which was a completely uh, different model, which was uh, ultralight. I think you can guess who made this one. Um, and um, and yeah, so, so basically the players were asked to arrange the violins into categories by putting the ones that are similar together and the ones that are dissimilar in different groups. And they could make as many categories as uh, they wanted. So they basically had about an hour to play the different instruments and to put the grouping, to, to put them into groups. And at the end, they had to label each group and explain uh, to me why they put this violin into that group. But they were completely free about what to use. So some people use, for example, the, what they liked and what they didn't like. Some made three groups, professional instruments, student instruments, uh, uh, chamber music instruments, some some did actually things which were not really a longer dimension. So, you know, somebody said, oh, that's a bright instrument. And then that, oh, that's the instruments I don't like. And then that's the instruments which are powerful, you know, so three different criteria. So it's really what is most striking to them. 
Uh, so there are two types of measure we can do on this uh, data. We have uh, we can measure the consensus among violinists. So we can look at the number of violinists who sorted violins within the same category. That's basically a measure of similarity between violins. And we could look at the we can look at the verbal comments on each category by doing a linguistic analysis of uh, the semantic properties shared by the violins within groups. So let's talk about the first, the consensus. So uh, basically, we do an, a statistical analysis of how the violins were grouped. And that ends up in what we call the hierarchical tree. And what you see is uh, the smallest, basically, um, the lowest this horizontal bar is. That means that the, the more these two violins were grouped together. So these violins were grouped quite a lot. The distance between these two violins is is uh, rather small, but the distance between these two violins and these two violins is, is pretty far because you have to add up this plus this plus this and then on the other side. Okay, so what we can see is that basically we have two main groups and each main group is actually divided in two groups. So we have one group here, one group here, one group here and one group here. So basically almost like two instruments uh, in each group. So here we, we do have the Del Jesu models together. Uh, indeed, they were grouped together. Um, we, what else we have is we have the old violins, which are in three different groups. So that's really in line with my previous experiment showing that people were not able to uh, reliably tell old violins from new violins because they don't have specific properties. And that's really uh, highlighted here again. Otherwise, you would have had the V1, V3, V2 put together in one group. No, they are in three different groups. So that means that the property they have as an old violin is not something that can be filled by a player. Um, but, uh, and I want to say as well that, okay, two, six, and four with Sergio Del Jesu uh, have been put together, but you see that there were put within a bigger group which contains two strads. So these two strads were actually closer to this Del Jesu model than they are closer to other strad models. So there are still something which is, uh, you can see that it's not completely obvious that they share unique properties because you have strads which can have Del Jesu prop or being closer to Del Jesu violins than to other strad violins. Now it's interesting to look at uh, how people actually group them. So if we look at a uh, violin two, six, and or two, four, or four and six, you know, how many people put them together? There were 18 who really put two, six, two, four, four, and six together. But there are only six which actually put two, four, six as one group. Okay, so that's six out of 21 players who put two, four, and six together. Uh, oops, sorry. There are eight people who put three and seven together. There are seven people who put one and five together and eight people who put eight and nine together. And considering there are 21 players, you can see that the consensus is not even on half of the players, you know, it's less than half who actually put these violins together. So that means that there are still quite a lot of viability um, as we have noticed in all other experiments we have done so far, where people don't agree, and so you don't necessarily see very strong uh, features. Andrew asks in the chat, um, or did they just not sort the old violins as old violins? Old violins at old. I imagine he means something like that the criteria they used to group them. Yeah. Not. Uh, I'm I'm putting all the old instruments together, uh, but was I put a bright or warm or whatever, um, so that they did not focus on old violins and therefore they are not together. I think is that correct, Andrew, or am I misreading how you, what your question is exactly? Yes, that's correct. They're just sorting by different criteria. Yeah, but what I mean is like if they they were sorting by different criteria, but for it was the most 
relevant and, uh, and striking criteria for them. And if there was really something common to old violins compared to new violins, we should have seen it because it should have been the most striking point. Uh, sorry, but, but did they actually state that they grouped the violins as old violins or no, new they violins? No, anyways, they didn't know they were new and old violins, you know, they were just given uh, nine instruments to categorize. It right. just, I'm saying is that, that that was not perhaps not a criteria to them. So to say that they couldn't dis differentiate old from new, maybe they didn't care whether they were old or new, they were just differentiating them based on other characters. Uh, when, when I was talking about not being able to differentiate between old and new, that's what I was referring to my previous experiment. Here, I'm just saying that if there, if there had been something striking as a characteristic as a new instrument compared to an old instrument, we would have seen it in the grouping. It's not because we don't see it in the grouping that then there is nothing, okay? But it's not something very striking because if it was striking and people would have been sensitive to it, we would have seen it. Um, Terry, uh, we, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, we can continue this discussion. It, 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 it will be a long discussion, so I'll let, let the conversation continue. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to talk about it again after, maybe after I finish, so. Excellent. We can go after, uh, when Claudia's talk is finished, we can go more on it. Uh, Terry asks, are there any differences of preference between professional players and amateur players? Because you had six amateurs, I believe. Yeah. Um... I haven't looked into this because then six is basically almost too small to really draw conclusions, you know. So it's a bit hard to know whether it's because there are these six in particular, or is that because they are amateurs? So I didn't really into it. If I had more, like maybe more like 11 and 11 of each, yes. But six is really a bit at the limit of being able to really look into the details. So, so I didn't. Um, what I know is one who actually, uh, I think there is one person we mentioned, we recognize one of the instruments. He said V1 is a Strad, and he said V5 is a copy of V1. And actually V5 is not the copy of V1, but is copy of basically the twin brother of V1 or something like this. I can't say too much because that, uh, it's kind of confidential which one we are used. But so, and this guy was an amateur. Uh, and he was well impressed because he said, oh, this is a Strad and, and this one is, is a very close, is maybe the copy of that Strad uh, and he was very close to it. Uh, but that's the only one basically who talked about Strad. Uh, nobody else didn't, uh, didn't say anything about Strad quality or the Jesu quality or it's just not something which popped into their mind. It also depends very much on the quality of the amateur players who participated. Huh? They can, did they play the violin for five years or perhaps they took a, a classical study of the violin? Well, well, actually that player, to be honest, when he started playing, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm wasting my time. You know, he was not such a great player, but then it was amazing in what he said. Uh, and I think he is not necessarily an amazing player, but he's somebody who is really interested in violins and has tried, I don't know, hundreds of violins, and he really had uh, clearly, uh, clearly had his, you know, his ear trained and knowing what he was looking for, and he really could categorize very easily with very precise criteria. While some of them who were actually very professional and top players, they were completely lost. They were like, oh, I don't know what really are the criteria I should use, you know, so so I, I don't think it's just a question of, 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 of quality of playing. It's actually of quality of basically ears and interest in violin making and violins and not just, you know, playing what you have been playing for 20 years without even questioning what you are playing. Can you verify, Claudia, there was a question. Is a V9 the ultralight and then yeah. what V8 is? That's a, a Strat copy? Yeah, it was a Strat copy, yeah. Okay, and so, so this was about the hierarchical tree, and now let's move on to the verbal comments. So I started with uh, 246, which are the Del Jesu violins. 
in terms of preference. So uh, uh, player one, we said that basically limited, you know, dry, knowing, distasteful. Then another player, P2, said less attractive sound. And then we have P3, we said very nice, but not as good as others. We have P14 said middle group. P15, good, but less good as the others. And then we have other players, P4, P6, and P12, we said, oh, you can find the sound that you want. It's rich and powerful. It's a group of vines that I like. These are my favorites for different reasons. So, you know, with uh, six, seven players, you can see that they go, the, the same group of vines go from the very bad vines to the excellent vines. That's in terms of preference. Uh, not surprised about this because this is what I've observed in all my tests. Now, what about, uh, this darkness, you know, feature. So started um, the bass just a lot of lower end. Bass end is strong, darker. So I was like, oh, maybe there is something. Instruments with warmer and darker sound. But then <laughs> you go to the other players, sound close to my face, bright, same, but also in the bright group. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, so maybe it's not that obvious and there is this dark bassy quality because at least two players found them bright. So it's two against three. So, you know, that's not a very big um, difference. Uh, and then uh, I looked into radiation measurements of these violins as well to see whether I could see something. <sighs> I mean, yes, the, me the measurements are different, but what can you see? I mean, you see that V3 and V7 uh, at least V3 is very odd because it doesn't have V3 as strad. It doesn't have a B1 uh, minus. Uh, and so it's obviously very odd. Uh, by looking at it, I would have said that V3 should just be an, an outlier and be alone by itself. But it has been put by V with V7, which doesn't look that odd compared to all the others. So I don't know. If we look at two, four, and six, there is some alignment at least on the frequency, not necessarily the amplitude, but on the frequency of the B1 minus and B1 plus mode, which you don't see on V1, 5, 8, and 9. But yeah, nothing that obvious uh, striking why the players did uh, these groupings. Um, I mean, the V9 has been uh, odd one out as a odd one as well, and why wasn't it put with V3, which is odd as well, you know, I mean, it's very, nothing very clear from, from the measurements. Um, and I looked as well at the, just the modes because Joseph Curtin had this uh, hypothesis that maybe the, 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 the Jesu would have a lower in frequency B1 plus and B1 minus modes. So I looked at the, at the modes, uh, so here are the four Strad models, or not Strad, but um, this one is uh, ultra light, but at least these three are, are Strad. And the two, three the Jesus. And if you look at the averages, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's really not that clear that this one uh, are lower than uh, the Strad. So this hypothesis that they have lower B1 minus and B1 plus is not. Um, as in, uh, doesn't show up in, in, in the measurements. Uh, so uh, the categorization allowed groupings which would not have shown up with writings on criteria, uh, because for example, two, six and eight, some players found them bright and some dark, but they still put them together. Or on preference, because some players love them and some players dislike them. So that's the power of categorization. Um, there were cases in which players made groupings according to preference. So the top two or three vines were in the same group. But in some other cases, the second favorite vine could have been a different group from the favorite. So that's why it's really personal uh, choice. And, uh, and this study suggests that contrary to the common belief, the universal descriptors cannot be easily applied to a violin model. And some strad model vines can seem more similar to the Jesu vines than other strads. But still, there may be uh, so there may be no specific qualities um, uh, to Strad models. Uh, but at the same time, we still saw some grouping of the Del Jesus. And unfortunately, we only have three Del Jesus. And that's one of the, now when we look at the results, it would have been great to, 
to have more than Jesus to see whether the grouping is happening because there were only three of them, or we would have seen that with more. Uh, it's just like we basically got the violin that um, people were happy to uh, let us for the experiment. And at that time in Indianapolis, more makers had uh, Strad models than uh, the Jesus. So uh, yeah, we had to. Deal. Anders has a question again. Uh, was uh, could you say if the the Jesus were late models or early models? Uh, I don't know on top of my head. Uh, I should have a look. It's published somewhere, uh, uh, the conference article. So I suppose. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would expect the later models to be darker ish. The, the Belgezo models? Yeah. Yes, uh, I don't copy instruments like many of the makers here do, uh, but uh, I've looked a lot into data from them. And very simply, I would say or guess that the early Del Jesus are quite similar to a Strad, and the late ones are very different and idiosyncratic. Okay. Thicker. Uh, different F holes. Yeah. Okay, I should, uh, I could check this. Okay, and uh, I think that's it for, for now. So I'm open to answer questions. Anais also asked uh, if the violin, uh, sorry, if the amateur that you were talking about, uh, if he was a violin maker or she, he or she was a violin maker. No, I don't know. No. I could see uh, Terry's comment about the ultralight. Yeah, the ultralight was like really the one where people, some people loved it and some people hated it. Um, uh, it doesn't matter, it was to have something different. Uh, the funny thing is like nobody noticed. I mean, it had a very special scroll and even with the um, goggles, you could kind of see it, but nobody noticed it. Does it have the special uh, chin rest as well? Fixed special what? Chin rest? Chin no. rest. Um, but in, in what you show, nonetheless, all the, the Gornari were grouped together. Um, the consensus on the vocabulary is complicated, I think, because we don't really have a common vocabulary. Yeah, for some people, dark means all, uh, hollow, for others, it means rich. So I don't know what you think about it. Uh, yes, to some extent, yes, you're right. It's just like. Yeah, but so saying that, you know, all the Jesu are bassy and dark, uh, then doesn't correspond to what people feel. So that refutes this idea of, um, and yeah, and the poem is like, I only have three. So it's really a pity that we didn't have at least one or two more. Uh, yes, but uh, the, uh, at your, the, if already for uh, the same word for uh, people means the opposite, then uh, you maybe they have the same idea of the song, but they just, don't use the same word to say it. It's also really complicated for that. Yeah. Yeah, but if some people say it's bright and other people meaning the same say it's dark, you know, <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> it's just like, it's hard to know whether the three were together. I mean, because uh, I had uh, five strads and the five strads were not put together, you know? So as a three that Jesu together by chance, we had the fourth one would have been together or would have the fourth one be with a strad. I don't know, it's hard to know. Uh, so could probably, probably, I mean, the only way would be to redo the experiment, but, uh, <laughs> and, and plus I need, I mean, obviously I need real authentic uh, instruments as well. And after all these studies, I'm, I'm not so happy to, get on loan against Strad and the Jesus because first I don't think every, anyone would like to 
let them to me anymore. <laughs> and plus it's a lot of uh, pressure and stress and like, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, but it, it would be interesting to redo. We could redo it just on, uh, on modern instruments based on, on these two models that, uh, that could work. Um, but it is you should ask Augusto eh? because he has a lot of old Cremonese instruments, so it's maybe easiest to do with them. Who uh, uh, Augusto from yes, the, uh, yeah. they just so have maybe, them lying around, so yeah. But I don't think, I mean, um, you know, most of the vines he has in the museum they cannot be played, so because I think that now they have decided that they will stop playing them. That's why they recorded them. They had this huge session on recording all of them because now they will stop playing, so. Terry so asks, uh, the slide from the last, the bridge admittance measurements does not show similarity between violins of the same category. Am I right? Yes. Well, the question is, the bridge admittance graph does not tell the character of the sound. Well, yes and no, eh? I'll, I'll let you ask it uh, as for Claudia. Yeah, yeah, no. Um... Yeah. Um, it it's may it probably tells something, but um, what I don't know. Uh, I've been working on the radiation measurements a bit more um, uh, recently, and I will talk about this on Friday. Uh, used uh, Bilbao violins to actually try different uh, methods of processing the radiation measurements because uh, the admittance measurement is only one measurement, so that's pretty straightforward. But the radiation measurements, you have like, you know, 12 or 24, because um, now, nowadays, most people actually measure with um, uh, vertical excitation on the bridge and with a horizontal vi uh, vibration on uh, excitation on the bridge. And so how do you process these 24 measurements? So I've been working on this and use a bit of violence to try to see whether there is some method which works better than some others. But that's, uh, come on Friday, we'll hear more. And it feels like, um, yes, the new way of processing radiation measurements seem to correlate with perception pretty well. Uh, it still doesn't solve all the problems, uh, it's just new results. So, but uh, that's a, a teaser, you have to come on Friday. <laughs> um, uh, but um, still, of course it's, but it's the same, I think, with, with the picture compared to real life, you know, a picture is 2D and that only gives you a, it's only a picture of what you can see with your real eyes, you know, so it's, yeah. I think to add to that, the, the issue is not necessarily the measurements and that um, it does not include the, the category. The problem is that we, we don't know where to look inside the measurement. So we have yeah, a but now if... range and we don't know, for example, maybe some peaks in higher frequencies that are alike determine that these two violins sound alike to us. But in the, in the amount of data that we have with this measurement, it's very difficult to find where are the similarities that matter and that make violins similar to, to Yes, but the thing is like now with the testing I've been doing with the Bilbao violins, if we actually hear differences between the violins through the synthesis method, now we should be able to look at the measurements and find what corresponds. So, uh, so. But the other thing as well is like, even if the measurement is kind of uh, accurate in some ways, the problem is still we have one measurement and you have five people and you have five different answers. So how do you match, you know, five with, with one? So still we are, st I'm struggling because um, I have one set of measurements but have 20, 25 different opinions. So that means that people are sensitive to different aspects. And so, and so that's why the, that's why the, the Bilbao set is, is very, is a very educational uh, thing because we have six violins where we know exactly how they have been made and they only differ by one aspect and we can do a lot of things. And now there is a bunch of, uh, of people from Vilfava who have been acquainted quite a lot with these violins and know these violins. So we can do a lot of testing and try to kind of move uh, towards some better understanding of what's going on. Um, but, um, yeah. So let's stop talking about Bilbao violins because otherwise I will start giving my talk, my Friday talk, and it's not even ready because I have new results. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ruth, that's that. Rob and and Rob, Rob as well wanted to say something yeah. for all the time. 
Rob, you have to unmute your microphone. I'm busy with that. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, I uh, don't have many old Italian violins, but I do have a record of uh, Riccardo Rucci. It's uh, uh, five uh, Ganeri instruments and six uh, Stradivari instruments. And when you play a high note on the violin, the low vibrations will come uh, in the where are they are visible when you use FFT uh, program on the sound. Uh, I use Audacity and I see the own frequency of the uh, violins. And so I, I see that the by Ganeri, they are around 288 Hertz. By uh, Stradivarius, they are around 270 Hertz. And that is the note that I call the, the B0, but I suppose it is uh, what you call the A0 uh, frequency. But there was a, a slight, uh, uh, quite a difference between the uh, groups of instruments, uh, as well the average as the group, as the individual violins were uh, about uh, 18 hertz difference. So, so you say that you have like a, a systematic difference between the two groups? Yes, yes, I, yes. The, uh, the Plowden, the Gibson, the Lafon, the ex Fiotan, and the Beriot, they had a, a frequency of uh, around 288, the average. And the Ernst, the Joachim, the Madrileno, the Monasterio, the Rhode, and the Spanish had about 270 hertz. And Which that is, is, that is uh, quite visible in the, in, a, in the audiogram that I make with. Uh, Audacity. Mm. Yeah, and do you think it's something that they can, you can hear, that makes a difference between the two groups? Do you think you will categorize the two groups of instruments based on this? Your hearing. No, I uh, I was very uh, surprised when I uh, I registered this because I had expected that it was uh, qu quite. Uh, uh, the the Ganeri uh, had the lowest the sonore tone. I suppose that uh, his own frequency was the lowest, but it was quite different. So I was surprised when I uh, uh, measured this in, in an experiment. You, were, you would have expected the opposite? Yes, yes. I prefer the, the Ganeri. I, I uh, uh, used to build the uh, the violins after Ganeri, uh, after the Il Canone, um, because uh, I like uh, the tone. Uh, and I had supposed uh, his own frequency uh, would be uh, the lowest, but it wasn't. Isn't this uh, typical for the Gesu models in uh, comparison to Strads that the A0 is higher in the uh, Del Jesus? Uh, as I, I told, I don't have many Italian violins, but on the CD record of uh, uh, Riccardo Ruggi, um, it was uh, yeah, evidenced. It, uh, it was not uh, all the violins of the Ganeri were higher, and the average was about uh, 17 hertz higher. Yes, and you know, there's a recording, a uh, similar recording with uh, Strats and the Jesus called the Miracle Makers. And uh, when you, and, and the, the music they play there yeah. starts, starts with a very strong G note. And if you in analyze that uh, transient, you will see the A0 of these instruments. And okay. uh, the uh, I think I've uh, I've done this for every thirty instrument there, okay. uh, and it shared on MasterNet many years ago, and uh, you see that for the uh, uh, the Jesus the A zero is stronger because it probably is uh, closer to the D string, uh, 
and uh, it lies higher up in frequency, which I think is typical for the GSS because it, it, that's the model uh, in comparison to, to strats. Yes, it, you, you say it's louder and it's higher of the Jiju. Yes. Okay, yeah. But that's not, I mean, in my measurement, that's not the case. It's slightly higher in frequency, yes. Yeah, but not, you can't uh, draw a conclusion on uh, six instruments. No. This is 30. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the well, it's a bit, it's a bit of a, uh, uh, you know, there's variation in models uh, within the different makers as well. So mm -hmm. sometimes I, I guess you can have the Jesu models, which are similar to Strads, like the early ones, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know this, but I think it is like this. So it's very interesting to hear what you say here. So I just want to say that I've seen something similar. And I okay. agree with you. Okay. Well, I have my results in the report. So. <clears throat> if, if I may comment on that, I just sent a link to an article uh, by Anders Buyen from Oslo, Norway, if I'm pronouncing his name right, who studied 30 strats and El Jesus. So I guess, like in general, if we are thinking about El Jesus violin as a violin with a thicker plates so we have more rigid bodies and if we combine it with wider uh, longer f holes we obviously will get a zero higher so it, it makes sense but uh, and, and another good question about by claudia like yes a zero is uh, significantly higher but can a player actually uh, get the difference that is higher that's that's a good question yeah <laughs> I mean, the tests I've done with like uh, synthesis, uh, sound synthesis shows that you are not that sensitive to one mode because you basically need a note to play a note on that mode to actually hear it or to play a, a note which has a harmonic on this note to really hear it. And then it's really when you compare note to note. Mm. So cool. it's something that you will really feel. But then of course you can my tests were done where I only modified one mode. In the case of a real violin, the A0 may be bigger, but then everything else is changed as well. So that's, that's why it's hard to know whether they are sensitive. If you just modify the A0 node, mode, people are very and are not very sensitive at all. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, the test I did with, um, with sound synthesis and uh, Martin Schleske uh, managed to redo them with an electric violin. And he said, he didn't really believe in my test. He thought that he could hear much um, finer differences than what I had shown. And then with this electrical violin, he actually tried. And then he realized that, no, actually, if you only change one mode, you can change it by a lot before you hear something. That's very interesting and good to know. Yeah. It's just because basically it's only when you play on that note. And so if you just play globally, you may not really pay attention to. Cool. Um, I have another remark. Um, I, I might be wrong, but I think Guarneri basically used the same mold, like the same proportion on all his violins. Uh, when uh, Strad changed a lot in his career. So no? <laughs> Uh, tell me uh, what you think, people. If, uh... Yeah, like uh, Del Gesso used, if you will take late Del Gesso from early Del Gesso, where early Del Gesso are quite similar to even threads and to a much grand patterns. And then when you, you get, will get older Del Gesso's where you have almost like H shape body, because they're totally different. Uh, you talk about the, 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 the um, arching or? Uh, the body shapes, the body outline. Like, of course, Strad went through uh, more, uh, uh, through several patterns during his life. And in the Jesus' life, maybe we can, I don't know, I guess there are people who know better than me, but maybe two or three significantly different models. So in general, Strad had more different models, but Guarneri had quite a difference too. Okay. 
Oh, yes, I, I guess um, this also influenced a lot. Like at the end, it would maybe be very interesting to see with instruments that are really made on the same model if you if it's relevant or not, if we can hear it. Yeah, I guess that's why exactly somebody was asking were, were those violins tested early Del Jesus or late Del Jesus models because they're different. Now, I think it's even more important in Strat because they are really different. The pattern. Uh, with transients, yeah, Andrew. Um, yes, I mean, I didn't talk about this, but I can I can talk about transients if you want, um, if you're happy. Uh, if you are too dead, we can stop now. <laughs> I just bring it up as a um, because basically we focus it, on one dimension. We forget about time. And, yeah, and in the in the experiment with the two cellos, because I mounted them with um, oh Timothy did we mounted them with the piezos. Uh, we were actually able to record the transients and and see how they were different from cello soup uh, like uh, soft cello compared to the rigid cello. Right. right. And, and what was uh, quite interesting to see is the fact that uh, for one of the cello, uh, the player said that uh, the D string was too soft, too um, molle in French, like, uh, I don't know how you would say that in English, like almost like chewy or like, you know, you can't really, uh, mushy, <laughs> thanks George. Uh, um, yes. Uh, and. And so we were wondering why, because obviously the, they were mounted with the same uh, strings and they were still quite similar. So we, we didn't really understand what she meant by, uh, by, by this. And, and so, and we looked at the transients and indeed the transients were much longer for that string. Uh, so it corresponded to her feeling that uh, it was not uh, responsive enough. Uh, but then we asked her, so we said, so why is it the case? And so by kind of pushing her a bit, trying a bit more, she said, well, it's because I don't know, I can't really apply the force I want to because otherwise I will uh, touch the adjacent strings. Uh, and so we told her, said, okay, but just try, push harder and you will see. And she applied more force. And then she said, well, actually I don't touch the adjacent strings. And oh, actually it's fine. So if we hadn't kind of, push her, you know, uh, we would have left with like, okay, this string is too soft. What does it mean? And we would have been trying to look into the measurements and, you know, without really finding any good explanation. And the only reason is because she applied less force. And if you apply less force, you have a slower transient. And she applied less force because she had the feeling that she couldn't because of basically of the geometry. So the whole thing about transients being uh, too, uh, long was actually because of the geometry. She's used to a much more like curved bridge than this one was. And, and, and so she didn't want to apply too much force. And, and so that's why we have to be very cautious because basically what we learned is that playability can be a geometry issue. And so it's no point of looking into measurements uh, while it's actually just the player doing something a bit uh, different just because she feels the geometry in some way and, and, and just it didn't apply the same force. There, there can be a strong correlation between the transients and the minimum and maximum bulk pressure, though also in my experience that, that um, if there's a, if the transient is strange for some reason, players often feel like oh, the string is too weak or the string is uh, too hard because they have the difference between the attack and the sustain of the stroke are very different. They have to yeah. apply. I, know, no, I, I agree with you. It's just like saying that, you know, she found the, the, the string too weak, but the reason was because she didn't apply in a force. Yeah. She actually dared applying more force, even right. if it would be touching the adjacent strings, she realized that she could. And then she said, actually, there is no problem. Yeah, but often you can have, not for this example, but often you can have a player say, uh, they, because they have to apply a lot of pressure to start the note, then when they, the note is going, they have too much bow pressure. 
so the string caves in, so to speak, um, because the transit, the the arc, the the, the pr pressure needed to activate the string and the pressure needed to sustain the sound are not in equality or not in sync with each other, um, which has to do with the transient not being responsive. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. <laughs> right. If there's a lot of chaos at the beginning of a, of a, of a bow stroke, um, yeah, that means it's because you, you need to do funny way. things with the bow that don't apply once the string is moving. That's all I'm saying. So um, this is was why I was bringing up transients, but uh, good instruments have good functionality at the beginning of the stroke. They, they, they respond quickly. Yeah, but then what we were surprised as well is like uh, Knut Gettler said that, you know, a normal transient is about, you know, seven or eight periods or something like this. And, and below that, it's considered as a good uh, start, a good attack. Yeah. And above this, it wouldn't be good. And yeah. actually, we actually recorded all the transients and, you know, on all the notes she played, which was quite a lot. And yeah. there were plenty of transients which were far above eight, you know, 10, 15, some we didn't even see where the transients were stopping because basically it was just as it, as it never started. And the player right. didn't complain at all. Right. And it was a great player. She was amazing. I really enjoyed listening to her. So, and in many cases, the transients were very long. She never complained. So, I don't know. So it, it seems that there's a transient can be responsible for some reaction and how the player perceives some playability issues. Uh, but at the same time, it feels as well that you can have very long transients and the player is absolutely fine. Because after each recording, we ask her, do you want to redo it? Or were you happy with it? Then, no, oh, I'm fine. And uh, when we look at the transients, we were like, she was fine. I mean, the transients looks very, Hi, you know, and she was absolutely fine. So, so there are still yeah, lots of uh, research to do in that direction, understanding. I'd like to redo the experiment with uh, different balls as well to see how for a given cello, different balls will change the transients. And, because at least that means that you have the same geometry for a given cello and everything is the same, it's just a bow. And will that will one bow will actually change the length of the transient? So it could be interesting. Did I ask what the uh, motion caption capture system costed? Uh, this is a cheap one. It's not the Vicon. The Vicon is about 100,000 euros. This is only 50,000. Yeah, still it's expensive. <laughs> oh, 40,000, yes. Yeah, it's something you buy once in your lab. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, then you get the software and everything you need to, or, or do you need to do some uh, extra development to get it to... Well, I did, I did buy a software as well, which was extremely expensive, 10,000 euros. <laughs> Um, uh, because the problem is like, in my case, I want to synchronize the motion capture with the piezo signal and the microphone, I, I recorded everything as well. And the synchronization is where it's very difficult to have everything synchronized. And so I thought, okay, let's just buy this software so then everything is synchronized and then I don't have to, do, to deal with this. In the end, um, I don't think it was a good idea because I think the software is crap in the end. Um, and so we'll probably have to stop using the software and just uh, find another way to synchronize uh, the data. Okay, so it's about uh, two small uh, movements then for the system or is the resolution you need uh, higher than what the system can deliver? Ah, uh, yeah, I mean, yes. So that's another problem. Yeah. So, so synchronization was just to be able to align the data from the motion capture and the data from the piezos to know exactly where the transient starts, 
compared to the Boeing pressure starting, you know, to the, yeah, to know, okay, the stringent starts here and she actually started making the movement at that time. Um, now, yeah, as I told you, we wish we could have even now the motion capture, I think the precision is about 0.3 millimeter. And, and that's basically 0.3 Newton and that's, Measuring force is very, very difficult. Not, not so enough yet, so. So it's impressive what you have very, uh, achieved anyway. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Melina? Oh, yeah. Can you ah. hear me? Hi. Yes. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you because I was reminded at the, um, the talk of the um, Politecnico Milano people yeah. of, of your listening test in Oberlin about uh, the projection loudness. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't know if I, I, di I didn't really understand this, these patterns that they were doing with the, the, from different directions that they got these patterns the radiance from different directions that he was explaining. Yeah, so basically they are trying to measure how, uh, because at higher frequency, the, the value is highly directional. So at lower frequency, it's basically like a monopole radiation. So it's basically like a sphere radiating. And so you will hear the same in all the directions. But at higher, um, basically in one direction, you will say hear a lot of the, thousand hertz area, but in another direction, you may hear a lot of the thousand five hundred hertz in another direction. And so that's what basically they are measuring. They are looking how, uh, what you can hear at different positions. So the, the brightness was basically high frequencies or? So he said that the brightness was, um, uh, from what I understood is basically, is measuring the different frequencies and then do some sort of ratio between a, an upper band, uh, but I don't know what is the limit. So for example, I'm just inventing this. And maybe they said, okay, I take everything above 2000 Hertz and I divide by everything below 2000 Hertz. That's something, that's what I understood. I don't know if it's 2000 Hertz, but basically he said it's the ratio between the high frequencies and the lower, lower frequencies. So I suppose you look in some directions and in some direction they will see well, actually, in that direction, there is much more higher content than lower content. And that's how we got to. And do you think, does it have anything to do with projection and lo versus loudness? Or I don't know. Well, uh, I'm, can not going, we... I'm not going to talk about pro projection versus loudness here because I'm going to talk about it for the VSA. Uh, and, um, but uh, what I can say say is that projections equals loudness. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I, I don't know. Because the thing is like, what makes it even more difficult is, okay, you have these directional patterns, but you have to think that then it gets reflected over the walls. So what arrives in your ear is not so directional anymore. Yeah. So, so the link between his brightness measurement and what we actually perceive is not that clear. Uh, but I mean, he obviously saw some differences between the Strad and, and the Del Gesù, which is along the line we have been discussing that some people think the Del Gesù are darker. So there, there is probably something to investigate here, there. But um, I don't think it's just by looking at the graph that you can say, oh yes, that's what we hear because it's more complex than this. Um, um, the thing is like, uh, I feel like we're already struggling with only like just um, a single frequency response. <laughs> uh, we already um, don't really know how this goes well with perception. So when I see 3D plots like this, I'm always a bit like, <laughs> How are we going to process all this information? And, uh, but maybe that's what we need to actually get links with perception. It's just, I get scared because I feel like I'm already struggling with one plot. So what do I do with all these maps and like, <laughs> find it harder to understand, but, uh, um, but yeah, so no, I mean, yeah. But uh, yeah, um, 
but because bright sounds or, or higher frequencies project more or you can hear them further away, right? Well, I mean, there is a link between uh, what I, I could see is like basically projection and loudness are highly correlated with uh, brightness, yes. Um, like so, of course, uh, our hearing is very sensitive to certain frequency regions. Uh, so, so perhaps if you have a lot of those higher frequencies, which we are sensitive to, then you perceive the instrument as better projecting and louder. No, because the sensitivity is in terms of uh, detection threshold. That means that it's an area where you hear uh, smaller sounds, but that doesn't really mean that this, uh, this area in the spectrum is more important. The sensitivity is in terms of threshold. So that means that at that at thousand hertz, we can hear a sound which is only it can it's zero dB, okay, because that's a reference. At thousand hertz, zero dB is what you can hear. At 50 hertz, it's actually 40 dB. Okay, below 40 dB, you will not hear. Uh, and so that's what means uh, being sensitive at around this area. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh you will, it will be more important. I don't know. I think that's what I understood. I, I had a, the feeling that people always get confused with these sensitivity things because that's really at the threshold, which you hear better, you are more sensitive, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this area. But at the same time, um, it's true that like uh, singers, when they want to project and be heard, they try to put the formant around the 2,000, 3,000 uh, band. Uh, so. Oh dear. Yeah. Um, isn't the origin of this from from the uh, equal loudness contours like Fletcher and Munson and later uh, Brian Moore with his ISO 226? So that's to say uh, a contour that's equal loudness. It's uh, it's maybe 40 dB at um, 50 hertz but not dB at three kilohertz. So that means actually those two, the 40 dB up at 50 hertz is perceived as having the same loudness as the three uh, kilohertz at zero. Yes. So they do- But I mean, the sensitivity we are talking is more about the fact that, um, it's not the fact that we hear better at that range because we are far above the threshold of uh, hearing. It's, um, it's saying it sounds louder. So you move up a few decibels. So the uh, you know, there's um, that uh, you know, it, uh, the contours are uh, you know equal to you know, if it's at 20 dB for three kilohertz, it will be maybe uh, 60 or something else for the um, in the down 50 hertz. But there is a, the di a distance between the contours is greater at the extremes. So you that, hear, that's what I was about to say, and that's why we are more sensitive. Yeah. Frequency yeah. response, you'll hear that difference more than you hear the difference. But it still means that the, the uh, that frequency band will sound louder. Yeah, and for the uh, same well, SPL dB, yes, you will hear what, it louder. What else does equal contour, equal loudness contours mean, other than that? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how I read it. Yeah, no, it, it, there are two effects. There's the fact that the equal contour is much, uh, the zero contour is much lower. So that means that you hear smaller sounds in terms the of bunch, the contours are bunched together. In that. And the contours are closer together. That means that you will be perceived like uh, more subtle changes. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. I, guess, I guess that in, in the low frequencies, uh, the louder the, the sound is, the more of the low frequencies we get. Uh, or perceive. So I think under the ear, I think you get more a more bassy sound than you do as a listener due to this. Merci. I had trouble hearing. Should I just go up and change the volume? I didn't hear. It's a joke as usual, but. 
They just change the volume on my computer. Okay, any more questions? No? Maybe I, I could add a little bit on your answer to Melina on the higher frequency range and brightness. I think it's crucial that exactly at the lower range, the uh, sound uh, transfers as a monopole, but when we get to the higher range, like uh, every mode is shining from the different place. And for our ear uh, uh, perspe perception, the novelty is a very big thing. So when like you can't uh, actually feel from what direction the sound comes. I think it can be described as a person as silvery tone or bright tone or shining tone when it's just like um, like a small sparkles falling on you from everywhere because every high mode like the, the literally uh, flies from uh, uh, different directions to you. I mean, it's going to be the case for every violin. It just uh, they will be different. But uh, and then you have the room. As I said, you have the room acoustics, which kind of uh, shuffled everything to some extent. You know, because you have the reverberation and so the reflection. So then it doesn't only come through the violin, but it comes from the side as well. So I don't know. It's not. Uh, I mean, it's hard to investigate uh, because. Uh, it's not something you can control easily unless you create a synthetic violins through like you know these uh, loudspeakers with uh, so many things and then you can control everything going in and you can say okay i keep everything the same except this frequency i change it going more from the left or towards the middle and does it change something to play to people i don't know there, there were a couple of articles where they just put uh, the player uh, surrounded by a circle of microphones and like the mm. same we were showing by Augusto and Fabio and then they just can see the sound pressure on different range of the spectrum. So I guess it's, it's pretty obvious that, uh, yes, like you, of course the, Acoustics of the room effect, but probably the first impression the listener still gets directly from the player, I guess. Uh, so the player says he gets it directly from the instrument. I thought you were talking about the listener. Uh, yeah, yeah, the player will get something which is direct. No, this is the listener. I mean, if, if you as a listener sitting in the hall, I guess uh, anyway, uh, you, you can uh, tell the difference of like some frequency that is just shining all over around the violin or some frequencies that is sparkling here and there. Even if the whole, uh, even if the whole rounds uh, all higher frequencies, like I guess still it can be perceived that higher frequencies are not so even as lower frequencies. And this is, 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 that's what we can actually see as uh, researchers where they surround the player with microphones. You know, is that, is that, I'm not denying that you hear the differences. Does that explain your, the way you evaluate the violins and the differences between that violin and that violin? I don't know. You know, it's, this is where I'm... I'll... Just for me, it was a good... Um, uh, um, a good picture to what bright is because like it is generally shining like from different directions but then yeah. every volume, volume is shining from every direction you know because it, globally it's the same box you know yeah but i mean if you have a more frequency response at the higher uh higher range of the spectrum like it's more shining from different directions if it's more like dark, hollow, and round, it will sound more dark, dark, hollow, and round. It will, it will not shine from different directions as the one that sounds in general like brighter. I think a professional maker is better at making 
the instrument shine like that. Uh, and it will also sound more like a violin should sound for uh, for an orchestra player or a, uh, the first orchestra player or, or a soloist. If it doesn't have that, it will never enter a stage, I think. Uh, but I think that when you're, uh, I'm not a good player, I'm a folk music player, sort of. And uh, when I listen to, I uh, have tried instruments on a uh, stage, for instance, in Oberlin, in the Warner concert hall there. It's like you're in, a, you're totally alone. You're, it's like being on, you only hear the instrument and I hear nothing from the room. Uh, so I don't know if this is general, that uh, a player doesn't get much back from a stage and a room, a large room like that, or if it's uh, me, I don't know, uh, uh, with less experience. It's, it's something that you should, that we should investigate before you can state something like that, because maybe you perceive it like you receive nothing from the room, but we don't know if this is actually the case. No, and I, I have to admit that I don't have much training playing in a large room like, like that. So maybe it takes a bit of training to, to get the subtle subtleties back. But you, but you what know I can what I about, oh, sorry, what I can say yeah. about being close or far is like uh, when I was uh, telling Melina that projection equals loudness, mm. uh, we did the test as well with an audience on stage, very close to the player, and an audience in the hall, far away. The audience on stage um, judge loudness, the audience in the hall judge projection. The correlation between the two judgments is 0.94, so almost one, so very, very high. Is that two points or? No. Sorry? Just, is that the correlation between two points? I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was 18 players, uh, 18, um, 17 listeners on stage and 14 <laughs> whole. Yeah, it's very interesting. So. And I guess when you fee feed, uh, the, uh, the sound from the instrument into the room, there will be something coming back, also of, of the higher higher uh, uh, content, but you lose more of the high content because the air is absorbing more of the high frequencies than it does for the lower frequencies. And it's also more directive. So uh, the energy you get back uh, probably must be weaker per, yeah, you, you get less back. In a smaller room, you get more of that closer to you and you will hear uh, much more of the, the, uh, the, the direct sound doesn't, uh, 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 um, what, what do you call it when you have uh, masking? It will, ma it, it won't mask as much of the sound coming to the left ear, um, right ear, so mm -hmm. so it's a different experience in a small room in com in comparison to a large room because in the larger room, uh, the radius around you will be larger, sort of, and uh, the radius to where you get the same sound energy. Well, we did an experiment uh, with George in an anechoic chamber and uh, and. Um, in um, in Mittenwald last year, where so we were look, investigating the threshold that people could hear when you put a little mass on the top of the bridge, so it acts as, as a mute. We started with two grams. That's obviously that's obvious for most people, and then reduced it. So it was a good training for for especially for young makers who had their first encounter with uh, blind testing and to see you know what they could hear and. And so we did that in uh, in, uh, in the workshop, and then we did that in an auditorium, and then we did that in the anechoic chamber because in Mittenwald they have an anechoic chamber, and and we thought that you know anechoic chamber to some extent should be the easiest because you have just a direct sound, no distraction, no uh, distraction, no reverberation, and we actually found it harder. We found it harder to tell. Uh, we were less sensitive to smaller thresholds. I mean, it was informal testing, so 
Yeah, but it tells that for sure. But at least our experience was we felt that it was actually harder and much harder than we thought it would be, actually. Yeah, uh, and it's not an experience we are used to. Uh, so we are more used to regular rooms and doing the judgments in regular rooms. That's and probably the case, yeah. But at the same time, we had the feeling that if it's too reverberant, then you are confused as well, you know. But uh, too dry, you're confused as well. <laughs> yeah, you lose information if there's too much reverberance. On the subject of uh, horizontal reflections, the uh, Freud E. Toolbook on sound reproduction is very interesting. So he goes through discussing the precedence effect. Uh, and in fact, the, if you get a lot of horizontal reflections, that greatly increases the amount of information coming to your ear, provided the delay isn't too long and provided the reflection isn't too loud in comparison to the direct sound. So a degree of uh, enhancement from uh, late reflections is actually an increase in information. And that is probably the reason why uh, the anechoic chamber is a worse environment for detecting the high frequency losses. Yeah, I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. And you know, this uh, uh, side information is also an issue in, uh, uh, in room acoustics. So if the rooms are too wide, they are not judged as good for listening to music as, as uh, why uh, it's better if it's it's narrower then you get more side side reflections and uh, you know this is like uh, we being out in the woods it's uh, you know in the woods there's a sort of uh, reverberance there with trees and uh, you are really imp it's important to get more important to get the information in the in the same plane as the as the as the ground than it is in the opposite direction so so i guess this is in fact, reflections on the vertical plane change our sense of the frequency content whereas this doesn't uh, occur on the horizontal plane i think in the brian cj moore book it's referred to as uh into oral non-correlation that is the the sound waves hit arrive at our each ear at a slightly different time, and that's how we, how we process it. Yes, that's correct. Mm. Just a thought uh, to the anechoic uh, chamber. Um, we were talking, or you were talking about um, the uh, upper frequencies going much more in different directions from the violin. So um, doesn't it make a lot of sense that if you're in an anechoic chamber that uh, a large part of the higher uh, frequency spectrum basically bypasses you? Uh, if it, you know, usually in a normal room, it reflects I off think. and it, it, it hits your ear somehow, which, whichever way. But in yes, an anechoic chamber, it just bypasses you and it's only a small, a small part of the spectrum uh, that actually ends up in your ear. So I, that wouldn't surprise me that, you know, you're basically missing part of the information that you would need to tell you, uh, uh, to tell, you know, one violin from the other or, you know, the mute on or whatever you, you were yeah. testing. Probably right. One of the old things in the anarchic chamber is if you, if you close your eyes, the violin seems incredibly close. And then mm -hmm. other people feel close because you can hear people breathing. It's a very, very strange experience, I think. Quite, quite unnatural for humans and the way our hearing has uh, evolved. 